I'll start by saying that uh, the conversation about democracy is a much easier one to have today um, as one doesn't need to look outside of the continent to see success stories, lessons learned and, and good practices. That's quite different from the early 1990s when NDI started working in earnest on the continent. So many things have changed, though there has been backsliding recently as uh, Dr. Siegel laid out in terms of uh, the number of democracies uh, on the continent decreasing and the number of coups going up again. I would argue that to some extent the divergent trajectories that we see today for countries on the continent, these trajectories are to some extent linked to uh, different trajectories that these countries have followed since the 1990s. Since then, we have seen some countries only undertaking superficial transitions to multi-party democracy, while incumbent leaders maintain control over the level, levers of power, such as the ruling party, the military, or the public treasury. For example, in uh, Gabon and Togo of the 1990s, former presidents Bongo and Eyadema allowed for political pluralism, but then proceeded to close or limit political and civic space, in effect maintaining one-party rule. And we're still setting a precedent now being emulated in several countries of having a family succession at the helm of the state. Other countries, such as Botswana, Ghana, Mauritius, Kenya, and Cabo Verde, more successfully succeeded in dispersing power and creating mechanisms for accountability through effective multi-party systems, credible elections, and a well-organized civil society and independent media, the checks and balances that Dr. Siegel was, uh, was mentioning. The regular peaceful turnover of power has become a clear indication of whether countries are on the right path. As Dr. Siegel was also mentioning, term limits have contributed to playing an important role in, uh, in regular turnover of uh, political power. In the 1990s, term limits were introduced in the vast majority of African countries. About 40 countries had term limits at some point. And term limits were seen as a means of checking excessive presidential power and of avoiding the return to the autocratic rule of the past by limiting the number of times a president can stand for re-election. Term limits are seen to help leveling the playing field by removing a strong incumbency advantage and facilitating peaceful turnover of power. So the respect of term limits helps to make the, the principle of peaceful power rotation effective. Unfortunately, the provisions for term limits that were introduced in the early 1990s were subsequently removed in many countries as leaders came to the end of their second term in countries such as Burkina Faso, Cameroon, and Chad. In total, term limits were removed, otherwise circumvented in 17 countries out of the 40 or so that had term limits at some point since the 1990s. Only in 16 countries have they been maintained consistently, and in eight others, term limits are yet to be tested by a president reaching the end of his or her final term. Once a leader does respect term limits, he or she sets a powerful example for successors to follow. A good example is South Africa, where President Nelson Mandela, who was a hero of the anti-apartheid movement, when he was elected president, after coming out of jail, he could probably have been accepted as president for life by many in South Africa and around the world 
but he chose down he chose to step down at the fir at the end of his first term and thereby he by that personal decision he really set uh, an important example and he raised the bar of on subsequent leaders in in South Africa so arguably there's there could be said to be some element of path dependency once you get on the right path it's easier to stay on it However, I would add that personal e examples of leadership are important as they set examples for successors to follow. A good example is uh, President Mahamadou Issoufou of Niger, who stepped down at the end of his second term in 2021, and that was the first time that Niger experienced a peaceful turnover of power from one elected president to the next. But now President Isufu has set an example for, for other presidents to, to follow. Now, how does the security sector matter for, for success? Security services that are supportive of uh, civilian democratic rule are important tools or even pillars in helping countries weather temporary challenges to stability and establish a norm of regular and peaceful governance. All of the countries that have seen democratic backsliding recently, Burkina Faso, Guinea, Mali, have seen the military play a significant role in that reversal. And in Sudan, recent developments are a glaring example of what goes wrong when the military tries to supplant civilian pro-democracy actors in a country that is trying to create democratic transition, a, a transition path for itself. Had political leaders, even leaders with very deep disagreements, been at the helm, they would have been arguing or seeking external mediation instead of initiating fighting in the streets of Khartoum. Turning to the role of uh, women and youth, I would, add, I would uh, emphasize that uh, youth have really been at the forefront of movements to improve governance and uh, protect democratic gains in recent years. In Nigeria, for example, we, have the, we had the NSARS movement in 2021 to protest against cruise police brutality, uh, and that movement was very much led by, uh, by young people. Subsequently, that mobilization transferred into electoral and political mobilization, where young people again were at the forefront for pushing for electoral reform that was enacted uh, last year in, in Nigeria, and young people registered in the millions to, to go out and vote. Other examples are youth movements to counter changes to term limits, returning to that point, such as in, we've seen in Senegal and, and Burkina Faso, where in both countries, youth protest movements that started as uh, movements to protest poor governance and corruption and limited access to public services then carried over into coalitions in opposition to the manipulation of, uh, of term limits. And uh, in Senegal, that mobilization carried over into the elections where President Wad, Abdoulaye Wad, who had managed to uh, get approval to stand for a third term by the Constitutional Court, he was eventually voted out in, in the second round and youth again were at the forefront in mobilizing citizens to come out and vote. Groups from, from these countries, from Burkina and Senegal, subsequently shared lessons learned with counterparts in the Democratic Republic of Congo, where there was an attempt ongoing at uh, changing the constitution so that uh, President Kabila could stand for a third term. But again, youth mobilization was very instrumental in in voicing citizen opposition to that move. In all of these instances, we have seen young people very successfully leveraging their superior communication and, and organizing skills, uh, 
very creatively using social media notably to convey their messages. And as I mentioned, often this mobilization in the streets has carried over into elections, increasing youth participation and engagement in formal democratic processes. Women have similarly leveraged their standing and, and organizing skills in promoting peace, democracy, and good governance across the continent. And today, Africa boasts of uh, three well-known women former presidents, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf of Liberia, Dr. Joyce Banda of Malawi, and uh, Catherine Samba Panza of the Central African Republic who each came into power at very delicate moments for their respective countries. Ellen Johnson Sirleaf held the country together after the end of the Civil War in Liberia. Dr. Banda helped stabilize the economy as uh, Malawi was running out of foreign reserves. And Catherine Samba Panza helped to stabilize the Central African Republic and uh, organized credible elections. All three women presidents left at the end of their term or accepted the outcome of elections, and they have been continuing in uh, a position as role models and as points of inspiration for other women and men after leaving State House as they continue to work to impact social movements and the lives of women and youth across the continent and they are clearly demonstrating that there is life after State House. Now, what interest do young African security sector leaders like yourselves have in advancing democracy in their countries? As Dr. Siegel laid out, democracies do a better job at delivering economic growth, resulting even in longer life expectancy. Democracy brings more peace and stability in, so instead of having to deploy security forces to resolve internal crises, resources can be directed towards investment in development for the country. Young African security leaders have a particular interest in advancing democracy in their countries. Democracies with their systems of greater accountability tend to result in more transparent governance processes with clearer lines of authority and sound civil-military relations. And democratic government provides greater certainty about career paths and equal opportunity for advancement instead of the uncertainty that comes with autocratic regimes. And paradoxically, the military is not necessarily better served by a military regime, as demonstrated by the case of uh, Nigeria. There, uh, General Abacha, who was president in the late 1990s, hollowed out the Nigerian military to avoid the risk of a counter coup. So armed forces during his rule did not receive proper training nor access to the right equipment. So that's a good example of how democratic governance is in the better interest of uh, security sector leaders. Now to the question of uh, what role external actors can play uh, in promoting democracy on the continent and how they should or should not be engaged, I would say that um, external actors can be important partners for national actors who seek to strengthen democratic institutions and processes. Groups such as NDI and many of our sister organizations can contribute with technical expertise and, and other resources. We can share comparative examples from other countries. For example, in Côte d'Ivoire, NDI conducted an assessment mission at a time when there was much discussion and disagreement about reform of the Electoral Commission. There was especially a disagreement about the composition of the, of the commission. Should it be political parties or civil society? Who should sit on the commission? And NDI came in with an assessment mission, met with representatives of the government, of opposition, of civil society, 
and found common areas of agreement and shared experiences from other countries about how a commission could be set, stood up and structured to best respond to the ex expectations of, uh, of citizens in the country. That commission has, of course, uh, been reformed further since then, but every time there are further reforms, there's always a discussion about whether this corresponds to some of the recommendations that NDI brought forth, so we are very proud about that. Um, partners can also create important avenues for coordination and experience, train, uh, experience sharing, peer-to-peer -peer learning, uh, by bringing together, for example, civil society partners who can benefit from networking and training and again learning from each other. For example, recently NDI conducted a uh, continent-wide conference in Ghana that was organized by two of our partners who we have trained over the years and who now are taking the lead in bringing together other groups that conduct election monitoring. And they were discussing issues around parallel vote tabulation and how uh, groups can learn from the experiences of each other. I'd add that uh, external actors can also facilitate cross-sectoral collaboration meaning collaboration between civil society, legislators, and also representatives of the security sector. NDI has conducted a program in the Sahel where actors from these different, from, from Mali, Burkina, and, uh, and Niger came together to discuss how to ensure more inclusive security policies in the region. What's important, however, is that external actors should always build on the expertise and experience that already exists in country. External actors should not be engaged to replace the efforts of uh, national groups, but should always be listening and taking cues from national actors. For example, when attempting to facilitate national dialogue to reach consensus on, on difficult reforms. Support by external actors will only be successful if it is well coordinated with and draws upon existing national efforts and expertise. <laughs>